Welcome to Rich Planets TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. On this week's show, we have another live audience discussion in store. And the subject on the table this time is the monetary system. What changes are needed? Mainstream news media channels are littered with economic commentators and experts who talk about national debt, interest rates, inflation, and the pain we must all suffer to get through this economic downturn. But none of these commentators ever question the monetary system itself and never ask questions such as who creates new money, how does new money get into the economy, and what is debt really being used for. To address these conundrums, I am glad to be joined once again by Ian R. Crane, who has given a series of lectures around the UK and Ireland describing the economic meltdown and financial terrorism. Now, Ian, um, is financial terrorism not a bit of an extreme term? I think it's um, absolutely uh, on the money, no pun intended. I, w what is occurring here is literally uh, the fleecing of the wealth of nations, of corporations, and of, uh, of individuals. And, and your introduction abs is absolutely perfect, because it fits in with an article that's in uh, today's paper on the financial pages of the Daily Mail, and it says, so many experts, so few answers. And, uh, yeah, your, your point is extremely valid. You know, the, there's a lot of debate, a lot of discussion, but nobody's really asking the pertinent questions. Okay, now, before we get on to some of those pertinent questions, on last week's show, you introduced some documents, um, because w we sort of came to the conclusion last week that Western democracies really don't have much power. And we asked the question, who does have the power? And you described it as a corporate cabal. In other words, large corporations which, which span national borders, they have the real power. And you introduced these documents which kind of um, suggest that this is the case. C I'd like you to go through them because we kind of brushed over it last week, um, one by one in date order. And just, just introduce these documents and tell me what they are, Ian, and, and who's authored them. Okay, I, I mean, I should emphasize that this is not a definitive list here. I mean, this is just a selection of documents that I uh, thought would be pertinent for the discussions that we were having last week and, and perhaps even this week. And um, so I, I selected four because I think that these four are very readable. And, so, and they're also readily available, so people can access them and, uh, and browse them at their leisure. This is the first document. It's called The Report from Iron Mountain. The full title is The Report from Iron Mountain on the Possibility and Desirability of Peace. And this is a document that is regularly dismissed as a forgery, whatever that might mean. Uh, I mean, we certainly don't know who participated in the... Uh, think tank that put this together and the reason it came into the public domain in 1967 was because one of the participants of this working party apparently had an attack of conscience and decided that the, uh, the, the um, essence of their discussion and of their conclusions needed to be put in the public domain and, uh, and it emerged as uh, a book report from Iron Mountain, and that book was published in 1967, but the committee itself sat 1962-63. And the, co the committee was supposedly commissioned because 1961, of course, was really the start of the, the Cold War, you know, the building of the Berlin Wall. And so we have this new enemy, the, the Soviet bloc, and this was actually looking at opportunities or alternatives, if you like, for controlling a population in the post-Soviet threat era. And the conclusion that these guys ostensibly came up with was that pretty much war is a good thing, yeah. you know, because it stimulates the economy, it gives people a focus, um, and, and actually none of the alternatives they came up with achieved the same uh, objectives as war itself. Now, if Zbigniew Brzezinski wasn't on that committee, and, and I have no proof that he was, but if he, if he wasn't, he clearly read it and thought that much of the content in this document was uh, actually worth repeating. And he did this in his book, we did, we, which you mentioned last week, Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. Now, technotronic is a word back in the 60s that Brzezinski claims to have uh, made up himself. 
And, and, and this and just to interrupt that, Brzezinski, tell us, he's sort of been behind successive American governments. Oh, Brzez well, Br put, to put it in perspective, I mean, Brzezinski is a protege of the guy I mentioned last week, Bernard Baruch, who was a very, very a powerful um, uh, strategist in the early part of the 20th century, and we'll touch on Brook again because he was instrumental in the establishment of the uh, Federal Reserve in, in the US in 1913. But Baruch mentored two people to effectively succeed him after he'd exited this mortal coil, and those two people were Zbigniew Brzezinski and Henry Kissinger. Brzezinski was uh, effectively an employee and still is an employee of the the Rockefellers he was the guy who identified Jimmy Carter as a potential presidential candidate uh, he introduced Carter to the Rockefellers the Rockefellers effectively financed Carter's presidential campaign and Carter of course became president in 1973 and as part of that process and to get Carter onto the world stage Brzezinski was also the instigator of the Trilateral Commission it's a very, very powerful player. He's also, by the way, claimed to be uh, Obama's mentor at Columbia University. Now, this is also this is something that I, I hesitate to mention because the official version of events is that Brzezinski mentored Obama, which is, by the way, the, the, the moment that Obama threw his hat into the ring and stated that he was running for president, I knew immediately that Obama was going to win because Brzezinski wasn't going to uh, be supporting a, a loser. But... The, there are many, many issues surrounding Obama, not least the fact that um, there is nobody who has come forward who was at Columbia University at the same time as Obama who can remember him being there. So what are the... Uh I mean, people can, can get all of that book here. Absolutely. You go to um, uh, probably the second-hand book sites like uh, alibri.co.uk or um, um, Abe Books, A-B-E, books.co.uk, and, and use their search engine to find this book. This book is actually changing hands for like £200 plus because it's, uh, it, it, people are beginning to realise that this is pretty much the blueprint, written in 1969, published in 1970, for everything that's occurring right now in terms of the technotronic control grid. So the next one we've got there, is that the PNAC document? Well, it is the there, PNAC document, but the link again is our good friend Brzezinski. Because in the 1990s, uh, Clinton um, didn't really like Brzezinski. So uh, Brzezinski, who was created effectively to be the Democrat version of Kissinger. Right. So it's Kissinger that holds fort when uh, Republicans in, uh, in the White House and traditionally it's been Brzezinski when Democrats in the White House but Clinton didn't really like Brzezinski too much so Brzezinski was forced back into academia and he wrote a number of books through the uh, early 1990s but the seminal book is this book The Grand Chessboard right. where in, in 1997 Brzezinski is actually making the observation that six years after the fall of the, the Berlin Wall and the demise of the Soviet Empire, the US is missing the opportunity to establish itself as the dominant superpower on the planet. And in fact, he comes up with the term super superpower. So and in this document, he says that you know, the reality is that um, even if, even if an American government did now decide that it wanted to establish itself as the dominant uh, player, the American people don't have the stomach to support such an aggressive agenda. And so he makes the observation in here, and he says that actually the only way in which um, the American people will support this agenda is if there is some external threat. And he makes the observation that he says that this external threat may have to be created. Mm -hmm. so, so that's in 1997. That's in 1997. Then the Republicans get elected, and well, then, then we get 9-11. A <laughs> year later, uh, there was a document written by the PNAC group, which included the likes of Cheney and Rumsfeld, to Bill Clinton, effectively telling him that he actually needed to get in and, um, and topple Saddam and take control of uh, Iraqi uh, oil resources, but Clinton didn't act on it. But then that same group... Not, not including Brzezinski, but the Rumsfelds and the, the Cheneys and, and a number of other um, extreme uh, neocons uh, who followed the Straussian philosophy of neoconservatism. And they produced this document, which was published in September of 2000, Rebuilding America's Defenses, Strategy, Forces and Resources for a New Century. And this is effectively getting into the detail 
of what Brzezinski was proposing in broad brush you know, four years, three years previously in 1997. And in this document is the infamous phrase, it's on page 51, I, I know this. And on page 51, here's the phrase, it says, further, the process of transformation which is effectively America becoming the dominant player on the planet, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Now, this document could be dismissed as the work of political fantasists, but then when you turn to the back and you see the, the list of people that put their names to this document, 10 of the 27 people who have their names in this document went straight into George W. Bush's government in January of 2001. And of course, on September the 11th, 2001, they got their new Pearl Harbor. <laughs>